Good morning and welcome to the final convocation of our uh, fall semester. We uh, appreciate you being here on this uh, fine late fall day. Isn't it beautiful? We are uh, pleased to have uh, uh, a wonderful speaker this morning that I hope you will enjoy. And we uh, will, in a minute, uh, have an invocation by Professor Casey Cooper and then an introduction of our speaker by Professor Ted Wood. Would you stand with me as we uh, seek God's presence uh, this morning? Would you pray with me? Lord, Father, you are mighty and powerful, loving and kind, majestic beyond our comprehension. We come before you now as humble sinners, unworthy of your love, unworthy of the gift of your Son. In this Christmas season, we celebrate his birth, our Savior and our Lord. We are thankful for the gifts you have given us and boldly ask for more. As the busy end of a semester is here, grant us the strength to finish well and the peace to pause for a moment to seek your voice and hear your call. We ask you now to be with us. Help us to grow. Help us to learn, to love, to find our place in this world, to discover our calling, and serve others in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. As you were being seated, the screen behind me said that today's convocation is hosted by the Gordon College Center for Nonprofit, or Nonprofit Organization Studies and Philanthropy. As you can tell, that's a mouthful. Um, but to add another mouthful, the, the uh, center, among other things, including today's convocation, sponsors the minor in nonprofit organization management and social entrepreneurship. So uh, any of you who are interested in, in that can contact uh, Professor Cooper and myself to chat more. Um, to, now to today's speaker, uh, Mr. Andy Mills is the former CEO of the Thompson Financial and Publishing Unit of the Thompson Corporation, where he also served on the board of directors. Under his leadership, the revenue for this group of professional and academic publishing companies grew to more than $3.6 billion and employed more than 20,000 people worldwide. In recent years, Mr. Mills has shifted his attention to his passion for Christian service. He's an elder in his church, a chairman of the Board of Trustees, and acting president of the King's College in New York City, co-chairman of the Theology of Work Project, and a board member of the Salvation Army of Massachusetts, Lexington Christian Academy, and Camp of the Woods in upstate New York, where my family and I had the privilege of spending a wonderful week this summer. He is also regularly involved in economic development activities in his through his travels to West, the West Nile region of Uganda, Africa. Mr. Mills lives in Winchester, Massachusetts with his wife, Gail, and their three children, one of whom is Chris, a senior, a senior this year at Gordon. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mills are also active foster parents. I tell all of you this not to boast about our speaker's accomplishments, but to demonstrate to you that Mr. Mills is well prepared to talk to you about the topic today, fulfilling your call. Please join me in welcoming to campus uh, Mr. Andrew G. Mills. Good morning. I see that the platform party know more than I do. They're deserting me. Um, for those of you who have fulfilled your chapel requirements and are here of your own volition, thank you for coming this morning. For those of you who are still working off your chapel credits, it's good to have you here as well. And uh, my goal this morning is to keep this as interesting as I can so that hopefully you may even put off some of that work you need for your next class. Anyway, uh, one of the toughest questions I think that we ask as high-performing people, and you are all here are high-performing people, is the question of what should I do with my life? What is the calling for my life? And I ask this question because as I spend time talking to people, I realize that for most people, they do not have a clear idea of calling. And in fact, one of the questions I'm asked most is, how do I tell what the calling is for my life? And I want to illustrate that with a couple of uh, illustrations, if I might, just to begin this morning. Firstly, as I spend a lot of time in marketplace ministry, I spend a lot of time talking in particular to men in their 40s and 50s and 60s who are coming towards the end of their careers and looking back on their lives. And even as Christian business people, I find a lot of people are very dissatisfied with their lives and sim simply asking the question, what did I do and why did I do it? 
Uh, I would argue that there is a malaise among Christian business people in particular uh, of not really understanding God's purpose for their work. And as a result of that, there's a sort of continuum builds up between on the one hand, people view work in a utilitarian way, which is just to provide me with the funds or whatever it is I need to do something else that I enjoy more. Or secondly, and maybe even more dangerous on the other end, is a sense that work becomes an idol, that it becomes the place that you go to satisfy needs that you have, whether it be status, power, money, and in many cases, self-worth. Um, I found this out myself when uh, about... I do, and people were interested in that. This time with no job, I'd go to people and say, hey, I am, I'm Andy Mills, and by the way, as men, we always ask the first question, what's your name? The second question men always ask each other is, what do you do? And when you had nothing to do, it was very obvious that people were less interested in you, and the self-worth takes a significant hit. So there's a sense of self-worth that comes out of work. So that's one set, the malaise and the Christian business people, a completely different example I want to share with you. It was just, Ted just mentioned that I spent time in the West Nile region of uh, Africa, known for two things particularly. One is disease, and two is Idi Amin, neither of which uh, you would want to be known for. Uh, but it's a place of very little commerce. It's a very backward place. It's a place, a place of uh, poor agriculture, chronic poverty, and frankly, idleness, even though the majority of the people up there are Christian believers. And in fact, it's even worse because in many ways, poverty there is seen to be godly. Well, on the face, these are two very, very different examples. On the one hand, someone who's uh, using business as, as a way of uh, achieving self-worth and power and money. And on the other hand, a community in uh, the West Nile region of Uganda uh, that has little commerce and poor agriculture and idleness. But I would argue that actually they're suffering from the same base cause. Their problems come from the same base cause. And I think that's a lack of understanding of calling in this life. In particular, I think it's a lack of understanding of what it means to be a steward of God's creation. And that's really what I want to talk to you about this morning, is what does it mean to be a steward of God's creation? Without that understanding for the businessman we talked about, there is no idea of how God or faith enters into their work life, even though they're devoted to that work life. For the people of Arua, there's no idea of the importance or the need for work at all. And I think this confusion around what it means to be a steward of God's creation is somewhat understandable. Uh, particularly, I think, as you are regular attenders of church, I think one of the things the church is doing is, is not responding or not uh, positioning this particularly well. And let me, let me say the following things. I think church focuses on two things. When you go to church, I think church focuses on personal integrity and righteousness. And by the way, that is a perfectly appropriate thing to be focused on. God says, be holy because I am holy. And that is one of the things that we need to think about in our Christian lives, to be holy. And that's appropriate. I think the second thing church talks about is it talks about eternity. It talks about the great hope we have, the living hope we have. And the only way to achieve eternity is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and His blood shed for us on the cross. Again, entirely appropriate. But I think when church focuses on just those two things, personal holiness and eternity, it misses one of the great commands that we have in the Bible to be stewards of His creation. And it doesn't therefore fulfill the picture of the full Christian life. God cares about creation. God cares about life. He cares about work. He cares about community. He cares about poverty. He cares about justice. All of these things He cares about. He cares about them now not just for some future time, although that's when we will see the perfect solution to all of these things, but He cares about them now and what we're doing them about them now. The Bible is a book not just of history, but the book is a, is a book of solutions and ideas for the now. It speaks to today just the way it spoke uh, to those of the, of the old times. And God has given us His highest calling. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, before the fall, the two chapters that we're not dealing in the post-fallen world, and look at God's perfect design for us, and His perfect design is to create us to become rulers over creation, if you look at Genesis 1.28, and to become workers and tenders of His garden, if you look at Genesis 2.15. So in this perfect world, when God was looking at creation and looking at it saying, this is very good, and looking at man as a steward of his creation, as a manager of his creation, 
This is what God was saying was very good. And by the way, I think when we use the word steward, and I've used it a couple of times already, it can be confusing because steward to us sounds like servant, sounds like not very important. But the reality is what God calls us to be is to call us to be rulers, calls us to be managers, calls us to be leaders. It's a privilege. It's interesting, in fact, if you look at Genesis 2.20 and subsequent verses, actually the first thing that He asked man to do is to name the animals and the birds. And it's not until that is done that God believes His creation is completed. In other words, God uses man as part of His creation. We are co-creators with God. So when I think about stewardship, what I want us to think about is God is still creating His creation today. We are still moving forward in terms of our societies and businesses, in products, in science, in arts, in medicine, and all kind of understanding. This is still progressing. And God uses us as the way that that progress is made. I would, I would submit to you that is a very high calling, that the God of the, of the universe, the God of all, is using us and commanding us to be co-creators with Him in this process. And I think if you begin to think that way, all of a sudden you look at work in a different way. You look at living your lives in a different way. How am I called to co-create with the God of all creation? You know, I think in history, Christians had a much better understanding of, of, of this and where this leads to. If you look in history, you'll see the Christians through the years were the leaders in politics. Christians were the leaders in business. They were the leaders in medicine, the leaders in science, in justice, in service, in healthcare. You go on in music, in arts, you go on and on and on, and you see that Christians were the leaders and there were the world changers in these areas. Where are we today as Christians? I would argue that we are not the people of the Word as we're supposed to be, but increasingly we're becoming people of the bubble and people of the huddle. And we're becoming, introver we're becoming introvert in the way we look at the world. We're focusing more on ourselves. We're focusing more on narrow areas of doctrine than we are about changing the world. And that, I believe, is not what God would have us to do. That is not being a co-creator of God's creation. So, I think there's one thing I would say that's even worse than that. And I think that we have created in these last few years a dichotomy between what I would call the secular and the sacred. And I think there is a common perception that the first role for Christians is to be sent, and the second role for Christians is to be the sender. And we see that in professional ministry. Uh, I was uh, listening to a uh, radio station the other day, and there was an advert on it for, I think it was ChristianJobs.com, although I may be wrong on that. But the point, uh, while I can't remember who it was, the point that came across very clearly is the statement on the radio was, isn't it time for you to move from doing something that's meaningless in the secular world to doing something that's real in the spiritual world? In other words, secular work is second class, spiritual work is really first class. Is it any surprise that business people feel alienated? Is it any surprise that people in Arua don't work? But I think when you think about a vision of being co-creators with work, with that being such a high calling, it's all sacred work. When God calls us to work, He calls us to His sacred activity, and there's no distinction and there should be no distinction between what we call the sacred and what we call the secular. It is just as important if you are called into the world of business, if you're called into the world of medicine, that you pursue that call than it is if you're called into the pastorate or you're called into ministry in some way. And we need to think differently about that to encourage those people going into these difficult places that they would take the love of Jesus Christ with them into these kinds of places. So if that's an overview, then how do we as individuals really work this out? Well, the answer is I don't know for each of you individually. Of course I can't know, but you can. And one of the things that I would ask you to think about is each of you is uniquely created by God for a specific purpose. Now, when I say a specific purpose, I don't necessarily mean there's a very narrowly defined job that is the only job that you can have, and if, unless you find that, you won't find God's calling. But I think there are broad swaths of things that God wants you to do and has gifted you and given you skills and passions to be able to do with that. 
And so one of my encouragements for you here while you're at college is to continue to, to study that and think about that. Ask friends, ask your parents, what is it you think I'm good at? What am I gifted at? What is different about me? What are the things I have passion about? Uh, one of the ways that I ask people to think about where they're gifted is to ask this question, what is it that I do that I, don't, that I kind of enjoy, I don't think is very difficult, but when I do it, other people look at me and say, how did you do that? And you sort of go, how did I do what? It's because it's easy for you. It's because it's natural. It's because it's lined with your gifting. It's because it gives you pleasure and fulfills your passion. What are those things that you have? One of the worst things to do, I think, is to not pursue those passions because those are from God and to pursue something you think you should be doing rather than something you really want to be doing and feel, and feel called by God to do. At this age in your life, please pursue your passions. Don't do what you should do. Do what you think God is calling to do with the way your passions are. Whatever that is, business, arts, medicine, science, education, matters of service, all of those things, no matter what it is, pursue it. You'll have to press through barriers. If you're doing what God wants you to be doing, the enemy doesn't want you to be doing it. So by definition, you're going to be pushing through barriers. Press through those barriers. Be the best you can be, as the army would say. But change the world. As Christians, that's what we're about. We're about changing the world. Be different. Some, there may be someone sitting here today who will be the future president of the United States. You have an obvious opportunity to change the world. But most of us will not be that level. Most of us will be somewhere else within organizations, dealing with smaller groups of people with less influence. But still the ability to change the world that you live in, whether you're working with a number of handicapped people, for example, how do you change the world for them? Whether you're in a classroom, how do you change that world? If you're a doctor, how do you change the world for your, for your patients? And so on and so forth. Change the world no matter where you are. Be co-creators. That's what God has placed you here to do. He's not placed you just to manage something passively that He's finished with. He's, he's commanding that you take what He's given you and build something with it. Create something that is more than you found when you got there. This is your calling. I can't think of a more exciting thing that God could give us to do. And I want you to contrast that with most, the way most people feel about their work. Go and talk to most people in the neighborhood about how they feel about work. The Monday to Friday and how they feel about Monday. I believe that God gave us Sabbath because we'd be so excited about the work we were doing that we would have to, He wanted us to take a day off, not the other way around. That, I think, is His calling for us. For me, it was business, and I knew that from a very early age. That was my calling, it was my passion, it was my gifting. I love strategy, I love pro excuse me, problem solving, I love building and motivating teams of people, I love competing, I love winning. I hate losing, but I do often, but I hate it. And I, I love creating things, creating healthy organizations. You know, when you're the CEO of an organization, it's the most wonderful opportunity, the most wonderful privilege you have to sit and think, how should this organization work? What's the culture going to be? What's goodness and what's badness about how we operate? How as individuals should we create together? That's a great privilege. It's a privilege to create value, whether it be for shareholders or whether it be for those that are building product. It's a great privilege to create wealth. And I'm unapologetic about creating wealth. Uh, if you don't have wealth, you don't have growth. Uh, one of the problems when we focus too much on the non-wealth generating sides of the economy and it grows greater and greater and greater is the problem is there's a smaller and smaller and smaller number of people who are creating wealth for the rest of the population and ultimately that leads to a decline in our economy. There's no wealth, there's no growth. But one thing you need to do with all of these things is not take them to a level of idolatry. And that's a hard thing to do, but it's something that God calls us to do. What is it for you? What is the passion that God has for you? What will you stand here in 40 years and talk passionately about? Because if you can't talk passionately about something in 40 years, I would argue you've missed your calling. Start thinking about it today. Do it as co-creators with Jesus Christ in this economy and this world that He's given you. But I would argue something further, for your work and your career are not the only way you impact God's creation, as important as those are. Most people, if you do a, uh, if you do a quick analysis of how many hours you're going to be spending uh, working, uh, 
uh, you'll see that work will take somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of your waking hours. I hope it doesn't take 60 percent, but let's say 40 and 50 percent of your waking hours. That leaves you with 50 percent of your waking hours to do something else. What is it that God wants us to do in addition to our work? Well, we're also members of families. We're members of churches. We're members of ministries. We're members of neighborhoods and communities. And I think God, in addition to impacting the world through, his, through our work, also wants to impact, us to impact creation through the way we work in the communities and the associations that we are part of. We will be held accountable, not just for our work, but also how we spend the other 50% of our, our time. Yes, leisure is important. Yes, Sabbath is important, and we should be involved in those things. I believe those are gifts from God but there are other things that we should be doing with our lives. There is more capacity that we have available. And so my encouragement simply for you this morning is to get involved with these organizations and get involved with them in an early stage. I think there's too much of a, um, in, in fact, Bob Buford wrote a book about second half. It was written at people of my age who basically got to a place where they didn't really understand why they were here and what they were doing. And he wrote a book called Second Half, saying it's time in the second half of your life to move to something more important. And the phraseology he used was from success to significance. You may have heard that phrase, from success to significance. Unfortunately, I think over time what that's become is it's become a sort of a, uh, a blueprint for how people want to live their lives. And it goes something like, let me spend the first 20 years of my life becoming important or wealthy. And then once I become wealthy, I can start then to think about doing something significant. So I have these two completely different parcels of my life. Now, I personally know Bob Buford, and I know that's exactly not what he had in mind when he coined the phrase from success to significance. We need to be thinking about being significant right from the get-go, not only in our workplaces, and I've talked about that already, but also in the associations and the societies and the communities to which we belong. Uh, my encouragement is for you to get uh, involved early in things like not-for-profits that w match your interests and to have you help build them. And I want to give you a little bit about what I've been doing in my life, just as some examples of that. Uh, again, not in any way to, uh, uh, to aggrandize what I have done. This has all been done through the work of the Holy Spirit, and in many ways I'm a reluctant follower of that Holy Spirit. But let me just talk about some ways that I think um, as you begin to think about your life, God can use you in the second area, the second area of associations. For me, I've had the opportunity to use my gifts, my skills, my experience, and my resources to help others. And I think this is the period of my life that I would say I'm in a help others period of my life. Uh, what do I do? Well, number one, I use my organization skills that God has given me through work. It's one of the things you develop in years and years of working in the business world. He's given me the ability to use those organization skills to come alongside ministries, for example, and other not-for-profits to help them achieve their goals. One of the things you so often see about not-for-profits, and one of the reasons, by the way, I'm so glad that you now are building a minor here within Gordon College, is that people with vision go into, into not-for-profits. They have a passion about what they want to do, but then so typically they have no clue as to how to do it the operational side of that. How do we actually build an organization? How do we raise money? How do we do the things we need to do to be successful? I find that the partnership between the visionary and the business person in particular is extremely powerful. And so one of the things that I'm on a number of boards that Ted uh, outlined, and, and I would say most of the time, what you'll find me doing is spending time with the, the, the visionaries, asking them what it is they're trying to get done, and help them think about how to do that. Help them think about how to form their organization. Help them think about how to raise money. Help them think about how to make the difficult uh, decisions about running a, a not-for-profit that they have no real knowledge of and have never been trained in. It's not my vision. And you need to be humble for that, and you need to be a, in a second, definitely a secondary role. But without twinning those two things, without twinning a vision and a capability, things don't get done. And one of the things I bring along is that capability. It comes directly from my organization skills. Sometimes I get more than I bargain for, uh, such as being the acting president of the King's College. I think my professors in Oxford would be turning over in their graves right now if they knew that I was the president of a college. I spent my toast most of my time in Oxford playing rugby and rowing and drinking, but that's a different issue. Uh, but, but God, I think in his sense of humor, uh, has brought it along that I've worked for many years on the board of this, uh, of this college, 
and ultimately has seen fit for this period of transition that we've got right now to have me be the president of the college. And it's a great privilege uh, for me uh, to do that. So that's one way that you use and think about the gifts and skills that God has given you, organizational skills. For me, second thing is God's given me a lot of life experiences, many of them not so good. When you look back on your life, you learn a lot more about the things that went wrong than the things that went right. And the longer you live, there's more and more things that went wrong. And one of the things you do is you get passionate about sharing some of those things with young people. So I do a lot of mentoring. Uh, in fact, this afternoon I'm heading off to the Harvard Business School and I mentor a young man there at the Harvard Business School, Christian men who find themselves at the Harvard Business School but are asking the same question that you're asking. Why am I here? What am I doing? What does God want me to do with my life? And it's a great privilege for me to be able to spend time just sharing my life experiences, sharing biblical passages that have changed my life, making the Bible relevant to them again uh, in ways that's fresh and new and exciting and talking to them about life experiences. That's the second thing I do. So firstly, organization skills. Second, life experiences. Thirdly, my, own, my business skills. Uh, when you've run businesses for as long as I have, you get some skills. Uh, you build some skills and some abilities. And one of the key ways I'm using my business skills right now is to fight poverty in Uganda. You know, uh, top-down money into Africa has been a significant failure. Um, in, in fact, in Uganda alone, which is one of the countries in which more aid has been poured than any other country, many of the NGOs are now pulling out of Uganda. They're not pulling out of Uganda because it's unsafe. They're not pulling out of Uganda because they haven't been able to place a lot of money in Uganda. They're pulling out of Uganda because what they found is they've created a class of people who are now dependent upon them and for whom there's a sense of entitlement. You know, when you bring $100 to somebody in, a, in an African village, they're very grateful. They'll spend that $100. But when the $100 is spent, they're in exactly the same position that they were before, except now waiting even more anxiously for the next $100. And by the way, unfortunately, in Africa, the $100 that get there probably started at $1,000, but is being taken by corruption, by corruption, by corruption, all the way down to only $100. Giving people money does not change their lives. We need to change their lives by actually changing the things they do. So I go to this little town called Arua in the West Nile. We've built an organization there called BVA, Business Vision Arua. Christian men and business, uh, Christian businessmen and women who uh, want to make a difference for their community, starting all kinds of businesses. I mean, we're not talking significant businesses here. We're talking one man who started roasting pork in his own little, just outside his kitchen, and now makes sausages and begins to process some of that meat. We're talking about another young lady who takes G-nuts or ground nuts, uh, peanuts, and grinds them and puts them into jars and is now selling them into the community. Uh, those are the kinds of activities we're beginning to build. Very simple, uh, a lot of rice processing, a lot of wheat processing, uh, a lot of honey production. These basic agro product production that we're doing, which before nobody was doing, nobody was investing any money into. Nobody was giving these young men and women, uh, uh, not, some of them not young, a vision of how business could create wealth. And instead they would wait and they would live out poverty and they would live out disease and famine. There's just been a significant famine there in the first half of this year as the first crop failed. Farmers don't even have enough to feed themselves. And uh, we've just helped with that famine. And now we're beginning to help lift people to understand the ways of business, to compete in ways that are significant, to build product, to capture value within the city of Arua, the town of Arua. Uh, it is an act of the Holy Spirit, and it's exciting to see that happening. For me, I am as excited about seeing this young woman with this peanut butter business. I think her sales are now up to about $400, which may seem to you to be absolutely nothing. But for her and for a community in which less than a dollar a day is the family, is, is typically the amount of money a family lives on, you can see the significance of those, that business beginning to build for her. So business skills and using business skills. Finally for me, funding. God has given me wealth. And I was unashamed about talking about that earlier, but now the responsibility falls on me as to how to use that. Do I use that for my own purposes or do I use that for God's kingdom purposes? Uh, Andrew Carnegie once said that making money is easy, it's giving it away that's hard. I'm not quite so sure I would agree with him that making money is that easy, but uh, certainly giving it away is hard, and I would agree with that. And that's the strategic responsibility I have. I know one day God will ask me to give an account of what I've done with my wealth, as well as the other gifts that He's given me. And so one of the things I try to do is use money strategically. 
I think about giving money to Christian causes, and I give exclusively to Christian causes. Uh, there's lots of people who will give money to Oxford and Harvard. There's lots of money, people who will give money to the Cancer Society and this, that, and the other. There aren't many people who will give to certain missionaries. There aren't many people who will give money to Arua, uh, to Christian businessmen and women. Uh, so I try to find strategic funding of things that I think would be very significant, both in terms of uh, uh, for justice, for, the, uh, uh, the, for repealing poverty and turning back poverty, and also for the defense of the Christian faith. And in fact, one of the major investments I'm making of late is in this, uh, um, this theology of work project, uh, which essentially is trying to define a new theology of work, rather like Lausanne def uh, defined a new theology for missions, so that we can release Christians in the workplace and get them to really understand what the Bible has to say fully about work. To me, that's strategic funding. So in all of those cases, organization skills, life experiences, business skills, strategic funding, these are exactly the gifts that God has given me, and I'm using them precisely to help other people to achieve their goals, not me to achieve my goals and, uh, and, and, and dreams. And I think it's interesting that when the world looks at me, I still get phone calls from people today saying, when are you going to do something significant? Well, by what that they mean, when are you going to get back and become a CEO of another company again? Because that in the world's terms is significant. You know, it's hard to try to explain to them that I'm using exactly the gifts and skills that God's given me in the most strategic and significant way I know how. The world doesn't see it that way, but God sees it that way. So take the specific gifts that you have, the skills, and find an outlet for them. And I have two key, uh, two key suggestions for you. Firstly, you need to tie together your skills and find the outlet for them. Uh, it, this is not like a short-term mission trip. Short-term mission trip, basically, and many of you, I'm sure, have been on them, and I'm a supporter of short-term mission trips. But what happens with a short-term mission trip is we're all going to somewhere together, no matter what our background and skill mix is, to do something in a foreign land, typically. So we're going to work with orphan children, we're going to build an orphanage, we're going to paint this building, we're going to run VBS, whatever we're going to do in some place. And that is good. And it's a tremendous experience for those people that go. I would argue a lot of the times it's actually less valuable for the people that receive you, but it's very valuable for the people that go. But what you're doing is you're taking people with all different skills and you're asking them to do something. So, for example, I've been on mission trips where I've constructed and painted. Now, if you would see anything that I would construct, I mean, that's a disaster. I am, I am one of the least handy people. But you take me for a week and you put me in this mission trip and you say, okay, build this building. I'm pretty good at taking things down, but I'm not really good at reconstructing. It's not a good use of my time. Similarly, I would say as you think about what you want to be involved with, only get involved with the things that match your gifts and skills. That's what's the best use of your time. Go and find things that, whether, if you're in the world of art, go find a place that you can do art therapy. If you're in the world of music, musical therapy or whatever it might be. If you're in the world of business, go find people who need business help. So, you know, when you go on your short-term mission trip and you're a business person, go talk to some business people about what's going on. Try to give them some help, give them some advantage of the things that you know which will help them the most. When you use your gifts and skills, you leverage other people more, more actively. So that's the first thing I would say. Make sure you really match those skills with what you do. The second thing I would say is focus on a few things, if not just one thing. You know, if you have, and I'll use this just as a financial uh, uh, example, but you can use it obviously in terms of your time. If you have $10,000 you want to give away in a year, there's two ways to essentially do it. You give away $100, $100, because there's lots of things that are, that are, are, are valuable, and there's lots of things that are good. That's one way of doing it. Or well, the other way of doing it is giving away two lots of $5,000 or even one lot of $10,000. I would suggest to you, and as a person who is, is actively involved in not-for-profits, it is much more valuable to get a gift of five or ten thousand dollars than it is to get gifts of a hundred dollars. If you give away gifts of a hundred dollars, you can't pray for those ministries. There are too many of them. You can't really have an impact in those ministries. You're not really involved with them. But if you suddenly say, there's one thing that I want to do, here's ten thousand dollars, here's five thousand dollars, whatever that am I, I want to focus my energy and my time and my resources into that one thing, you can have an impact. And not-for-profits who find volunteers like that who really want to come alongside and tie in their gifting with their passion are uh, enormously valuable. So two things I would say, match your skills. Secondly, focus on a few. And the third thing I would say is be consistent. The only reason I'm having the impact I'm having in Arua 
is because it's strange for this old white guy to be coming back time after time after time after time. They don't understand that. They can only explain it in one way, and that is Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's the only explanation that I keep going back. And at some point, you build a relationship with people because you're consistent. Someone once said that turning up is 90%. And I think that's about right. Turning up is about 90% of the game. And when you're in the business of ministry and not-for-profit and working with people, consistency and turning up and being there is really the, is one of the biggest gifts that you can give to people. Well, here's some ideas about work. Here's some ideas about stewarding God's creation. Here's some ideas about becoming involved in not-for-profit so that your whole life can have meaning to it. Because I want you to look back on your life and be able to say, yes, I use my talents to co-create with God in my work. Anything less is not biblical. Second thing I want you to be able to do is say, yes, I use my skills, my experience, and my resources to help others achieve their co-creator goals. I also want you to be able to say, yes, I made the difference in God's creation for which I was specifically created and gifted. Don't miss that blessing. In this way, you'll fulfill your calling. In this way, as Christians, we'll compete and impact the world the way we used to and the way we should. In this way, we'll bring glory to Jesus Christ. In this way, day, in this way one day, you're going to hear the words we all want to hear, well done, good, and faithful. In the words of Paul the Apostle, may you all be found worthy of your calling. What an adventure. Go for it. God bless you all. Thank you. conversation to meet, uh, bring your trays into the president's dining room and join